Hey guys, uh, my name's Tom, and I'm gonna be talking about how we use Mesos at HubSpot. I'm just gonna warn you ahead of time, this isn't about Ray Kurzweil, so you might just wanna leave right now. Uh, so HubSpot is an internet, internet marketing company. Um, that's a nice picture of me in the background. Um, and basically what we do is, uh, let's say Dave realizes that this Twitter thing is just a fad, and he wants to go sell uh, furry, uh, furry car covers or something. He's gonna use you know, MailChimp for email, or Google Analytics for web analytics, or WordPress to use website, Hootsuite to do social stuff, Unbounce for landing pages or whatever. Or he could just use HubSpot and have it you know, really well integrated all in one thing. Now that my sales pitch is over. <laughs> um, so, I, so I mentioned a lot of different services there. Uh, we have about 500 different deployable objects in HubSpot, so that's you know, web services, or long running processes, or cron jobs, or one-off tasks, or whatever. We like to brag that we deploy 200 to 300 times a day, but that's kind of lying. That includes testing environments. Um, I like to say that we deploy to production about 100 times a day, and we do that with about 90 engineers. Um, so the way our deploy process worked for the longest time is a git push would trigger a Jenkins job, which would then cycle through a, b a bunch of different build packs, which are just uh, scripts that we stole from Heroku <laughs> for building things. Um, for each language, like you know, Java, it'll do you know, Maven clean package. Um, Python will just make a Python egg. No, it'll just show an NPM install. Once all the applicable build packs have run and are successful, then we just compress that folder into a tarball and shove it onto S3. When you actually want to deploy, we have a Python script that'll just extract that on the hosts that, you want, that you're deploying to and run you know, the executables inside. And if this is a web service, we also update load balancers. Uh, so this is all right, but it has some issues. Um, in terms of hardware failures, we run with multiple instances you know, for high availability. But if a host does go down, we obviously need to spin up a replacement, redeploy, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of manual work that we don't really like. Um, also, just in terms of estimating load and usage for uh, our services, I really wish I knew the information about the last talk beforehand. I think that would help a lot. Um, but basic, basically, like at HubSpot, you know, developers are responsible for their own services. So when they make something, it's up to them to decide, OK, like, how many EC2 machines should I put this on? What size should they be? Blah, blah, blah. You know, some people tend towards saving money and putting them on smaller machines and hitting scaling issues down the road. Some people just, you know, spin up gigantic boxes and have lots of wasted cycles. Um, and some, and we support multi-tenancy. So some people just have like a favorite machine that they or a favorite cluster of machines that they deploy to. And you know, it's hard to track how overloaded those machines are. And then finally, you know, there's a cost thing. So there's a lot of trust when you work at HubSpot. On your first day, you have access to the Amazon account and everything. You could totally spin up a, you know, like a Bitcoin mining cluster if you want. No one's done that yet, luckily. But you know, the, the kind of you know, free will that you have to, you know, when you may spin up a new service, just having the ability to spin up new machines is fine. But the bigger issue is you know, if you don't need a machine anymore, you don't always remember to disperse it. So there's a lot of wasted money there. So obviously Mesos, you know, the features that Mesos provides is really useful here. So we first heard about Mesos in 2012 after Google I.O. And we attempted during a hackathon to try to integrate it into our deploy infrastructure. And like most hackathon projects, it was a spectacular failure. <laughs> and part, part of it was due to you know, Mesos being like a really early project, but I think most of it was just us being really naive and like thinking that we could go from zero to 60 with Mesos in a day or two. So we tried it again last September and had a lot more success um, thanks to you know, better documentation, um, you know, some not really nice open source frameworks like Aurora and uh, Kronos and Marathon. Um, really nice people on the mailing list and the nice guys at Mesosphere that helped us out a lot. So we were actually able to get a prototype working. Um, I kind of think of myself as more of a plumber than anything else. One of the first things that I did was I added the ability to condense Mesos clusters in um, our provisioning system. So this is a screenshot of Rainmaker, which is what we use to condense or you know, provision machines. So in this screenshot, I'm just about to condense in a thousand node cluster of C38XLs. It's probably a good idea that I didn't click that button because that would cost HubSpot like $1.7 million a month. <laughs> but I could totally do that if I wanted to. So um, like I said, for our prototype, we were using Marathon and, Sing uh, sorry, Marathon and Kronos to run tasks. For those of, who, of you who don't know, Marathon is a framework for running long-running processes, and Kronos is a framework for doing scheduled jobs. 
They're, gro they're both great pieces of software, but they kind of follow the Unix philosophy of like doing one thing really well. And we, we were left to pick up the slack of you know, coordinating everything and orchestrating everything. So for that reason, and also just because we wanted more experience you know, programming with Mesos, we created our own framework called Singularity. Um, we named it Singularity because originally it was going to be for one-off tasks, but then we added the ability to do long-running processes and scheduled jobs. Um, so it uses Zookeeper for state queuing and leader election and MySQL for history. We actually have a really nice Vagrant box. So like, I challenge all of you while I'm talking to like, you know, Vagrant up our Singularity box and see if you can get it working by the end of my talk. <laughs> um, but anyway, so there's two main objects in Singularity. There's a request, which was really poorly named because all of our engineers get them confused with HTTP requests. But it's basically a request to execute tasks. You can basically think of it as a deploy. And then we have Singularity tasks which are one-to-one -one mapping to Mesos tasks. So this is what it looks like when you actually deploy something to Singularity. Um, unlike other frameworks, you can, actually, you can post your deploy request to any of the Singularity hosts, and it does some very basic validation, and then um, puts it onto the pending queue, being transformed into a Singularity pending request, which just has a little bit extra more um, metadata. The Singularity leader is constantly draining that pending queue, and what it does is it turns a request into one or more singularity pending tasks, which have a has a scheduled time to run. For long running processes, it just runs immediately. And obviously for scheduled things, it interprets the current schedule to figure out when's the next time it should run. At the same time, the singularity leader is running the meso scheduler, and it's you know, receiving resource offers. And every time it receives an offer, it inspects the scheduled queue to see what tasks, yeah, are there any tasks that should run now? And if there are, and the offers you know, fulfill what we want, then we will you know, either accept or decline these offers. And then when tasks complete, you know, we get the updates from, the, from Mesos, goes into the Mesos scheduler. We fire up webhooks for anyone who's interested in receiving these. We you know, put things back onto the scheduled queue if it's a type of re uh, request that should be restarted. And then we also fire off emails to owners of the tasks so that they know something happened. So this is a screenshot of the status page. It's kind of the first thing you see when you go to Singularity. You can see, you know, we've got two hosts in our cluster right now. One of them is running the driver, and they've been up for three hours. Um, the, the uptime seems really low, because every time we deploy, we restart the whole Singularity cluster, and Singularity will reconcile everything that happened during the downtime. So it's not something to worry about that it's only been up for three hours. Um, we are listing all the different requests that, that, that are in the system. So as of Sunday night, there are 507, 586 active requests, which just means you know, active deploys. There are nine paused requests. One of the early issues that we had was you know, we deploy some buggy code, and it would fail. And Singular just you know, pummel the cluster, trying to restart over and over and over. So after 10 failures, we just put it into a pause state where it doesn't try anymore. Um, that pending number, again, is just you know, how many requests are in that pending queue. Um, if that number is way high, that's a good indicator that something is wrong with Singularity, or maybe it's not getting resource offers. Um, and then finally, we have a cleaning queue, which corresponds to being able to drain a slave or drain a rack. Um, below all that, we have tasks, which are you know, actual things running in the system. So uh, we had 400 active tasks Sunday night, which is a pretty, it's pretty average for that cluster. We didn't have any overdue tasks, which is good. That means a task was scheduled to run and it just hadn't been executed yet, either due to Mesos issues or not having enough resources or whatever. We also had 135 future tasks, which usually correspond to cron jobs. Oop, sorry. So if we click on that 586 number, we go to the active request screens where we can see all the you know, deploys to the system. You can see 14 minutes ago at that time I deployed our example drop wizard service. Um, but let's click on the pinger app in the middle there. So we can see here, you know, who deployed it, when they deployed it, the ability to, you know, tear down that request with a remove button, and finally there, you know, it shows that there's one active task currently running. So if we click on that, we can see more information about that task. We can see, you know, the state transi transitions. We can see that it took less than a minute to start up. We can see the Meso sandbox with all the different files. And uh, it's cut off on the screen there, but if we click on the standard error file, we can see just like in the Mesos UI, you know, we can tail the output and see what's going on. So this is all really good and um, useful to developers, but one really nice thing is, let's say, you know, Pinger dies. Well then, um, instead of me or someone operating a cluster getting an error, we actually send a really nice error email 
to the person who owns that service. So like I said before, we're, we're 90 developers and there's basically three people operating the Mesos cluster. So we try to push as much you know, issues as we can to the developer that made the service and just let them escalate it to us if it really is a Mesos issue. So this is all good, but we haven't gotten far enough to actually you know, get a web service online yet. So for that, we have this other project called Baragon, which is one of my favorite Godzilla monsters. <laughs> a lot of our internal tools are named after Godzilla monsters. Um, so Baragon is another open source service that basically just receives Mesos tasks. Oh, do you want to take a picture? <laughs> it's, it's a pretty awesome photo, I do have to say. Um, so Baragon is really simple. All it does is it receives Mesos task updates um, and updates you know, appropriate load balancers as needed. Uh, we run Nginx for our load balancers, so at the same time, um, anything registered in Baragon, is, um, being, its health check endpoint is being hit so that we can pull them out quickly. If we were, do, if we were using HAProxy, I don't even think we would have bothered adding it because HAProxy will do it by default. Uh, so we also have Rodan on the <laughs> Godzilla monster scheme. This one actually isn't open source, but there's no reason it's not. We just basically haven't gone around to it yet. Um, Rodan is our monitoring system. So it's responsible for collecting metrics. Every HubSpot service that we make is instrumented to send off important metrics to Rodan. And we also have pingers for things that we didn't write. So like we have pingers for Mesos and pingers for Singularity. Um, so it, it collects metrics. Uh, it has a really simple rule evaluation engine. And then we're able to you know, do alerts based on those rules. Um, so this is Rodan's view of that Mesos cluster. I'm, hopefully you guys can read that. Um, so basically, you know, we're listing the masters. We know which is the current master, how many slaves it knows about, how many tasks, resources, everything. That's very useful. Below that, we have information about singularity. We're running singularity on the same host as the masters, just to make things simpler. Um, and we can see you know, which one is the singularity leader, is the driver actually running, and then you know, different information about requests and tasks in the cluster. And then finally, we have all our different slaves and you know, what tasks are running and the resource utilization on those. Um, so obviously, it's really important to have good alerting for these things. In the beginning, we were super naive, and we only had alerts for these two metrics time since last offer and slave resources. We figured if we filled up the cluster, you know, the slave resources alert would go off. And if Mezos shot the bed, uh, the time since last offer thing would be out of whack. But we actually got into a really interesting situation where we originally spun up the cluster with M1 mediums. And we had it alerting on like 90% memory or CPU. So that, so that all sounds all right. But at the same time, we were defaulting services to get one CPU and I think half a gig of memory by default. And the way the percentages worked is like 10% of the M1 medium memory is greater than 512, or it was something like that. And so we were you know, migrating services onto this cluster, filling up the slaves. There would be less than 512 megabytes of memory left, but Mesos would still happily send those offers and we just you know, reject them. So we had no idea to, we had no alerting as to something was wrong there. We basically looked like assholes for a day. Uh, so, we, so we ended up adding those two metrics on the top, number of overdue tasks and max, max task lag into singularity. Um, no ver, number of overdue tasks is pretty self-explanatory, just how many tasks you know, didn't get run yet. And then max task lag is how overdue is the most overdue task. And uh, you know, the combination of all those makes uh, monitoring pretty good. Uh, so kind of to sum things up, uh, we really like Mesos because it forces us, it allows and forces us to better quantify our services. Like I said before, if I was making a service before Mesos, it would just be like, okay, what flavor of EC2 machine am I going to use and how many of them? But now it's like, okay, I, I need you know, this many CPUs, this much memory, and this much instances. And I you know, have data on whether or not that is enough, and I can tweak that really, really easily. We also really like how we have more, both more fixed and reduced costs. Uh, like our, our QA cluster is now like a solid, you know, like, you know, like 10 grand a month. Whereas before, it would fluctuate depending on you know, people making new services and spinning up new machines and flip-flopping around. So that's really good. Um, we also really like the fault tolerance and isolation that Mesos provides. Um, and that's pretty self-explanatory, but there's also some really nice features that goes into the costs argument. So 
before, like I said, we would host services with multiple instances. So, you know, if a machine or an entire availability zone would go down, we'd still, you know, be able to serve requests. But we obviously keep, you know, are still doing that for some important services, but there are some services that can stand like little blips in downtime. Yeah, you know, more, more for internal things than customer facing things. So in that sense, you know, we can only just, we can just do one instance, let Mesos handle, you know, restarting the task or moving it to different slaves when things go wrong, and then save the money of not having as many hosts. We also like Mesos because it's just so damn cool. So um, that's in a nutshell.